hello and welcome to the last network book forum of the year hearing for digital remains on the book's death glitch how techno solutionism fails us in this life and beyond and resurrecting the body race and the digital afterlife I'm Eretia Kiriade, Network Engagement Associate at Data and Society. Today's conversation is hosted by Tamara Knopper and Labor Futures Senior Researcher at Data and Society, and is supported by Assistant Producer Tunika Onakikami and myself. For those of us joining us for the first time, Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and regularly convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. A quick thank you to everyone who opted in during our book raffle uh, registration. The raffle winners will receive an email in the coming days requesting their mailing address to receive a copy of either Death Glitch or Resurrecting the Black Body. So I'm happy to hand it off to our host and join you all in listening with us to what will be an absolutely engaging and dynamic conversation. Thank you, Tim. Okay, thank you, Arete. Um, Arete, and I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. And I especially wanna thank Tanika and Arete for co-producing this event and um, for Tamara and Tanya for inviting me to be in the conversation with them. So I wanna welcome everyone to Caring for Digital Remains, featuring authors, Dr. Tamara Nice and Dr. Tanya Sutherland. The term care is one we hear of often these days and in labor study scholarship, the term care has long been interrogated. Care is often associated with particular industries called caring industries or care work. Jobs are assumed to be labors of love, like home health care workers, teachers, social workers, and domestic workers. This care work is often praised for being essential, but often rewarded with low wages, long hours, and poor work conditions. This work is moralized as righteous, but is often unsustainable, taking its toll on caregivers, and it reflects a lack of respect and real investment in a social welfare state and a public workforce. In political circles, care work can be seen as essential labor as well, filling in for the organized abandonment by the state or to fight against state repression. The care, this care work can include mutual aid, supporting protesters, and legal and political defense campaigns. Like the care work associated with the labor market, the sustainability of this collective care has also been questioned. And so today we will be in conversation with two scholars, Dr. Neese and Dr. Sutherland, whose new books contribute to the body of scholarship and the growing public conversation about care and consider the politics and labor of care as they relate to death and the internet and caring for digital remains. So Dr. Neese's book, Death Glitch, How Techno-Solutionism Fails Us in This Life and Beyond, explores the labor, individual, collective, technological, behind digital production and preserving digital legacies. Dr. Sutherland's book, Resurrecting the Black Body, Race and the Digital Afterlife, examines how anti-Blackness shapes the ubiquity of Black death on the internet, as well as how Black life is digitally commodified. Both Dr. Nieces and Dr. Sutherland's books consider not only death, but also life, including how the living contend with our future deaths <clears throat> and plan our digital estates, how we tend to and try to protect digital remains and engage in archival practices, how this care can be collective and how we must negotiate and confront the too often reality of premature death, the risk of visibility, the bureaucracy in terms of use of social media companies and online platforms and others quest to capitalize on death. And both consider the labor of caring for digital remains and its toll on individuals, families, communities and society but also the way that caring can be a form of renewal, resistance, and um, resurgence. So awesome, let's start. I wanna start by asking you both, um, you both have these kind of interesting trajectories and relationships to academia and to kind of uh, writing these books. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna just mention very quickly the bios here, and then we're gonna get to some of the kind of background of some of you, of both of you. So Tamara Nice is a senior researcher and algorithmic, algorithmic impact methods lab director at Data and Society. And Tanya Sutherland is assistant professor of information studies at UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, and co-director of the Community Archives Lab at UCLA, and co-founder and co-director of After Lab at the University of Washington's iSchool. So 
I want to start with uh, um, you, Tanya. You actually came into kind of uh, writing your book and scholarship and kind of that trajectory in academia through being a librarian and masters of library science and archival work. And I was going to ask if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my my graduate degree is a master in library and information studies, a master in library and information science, actually. Um, and then my PhD is is in library is in information studies as well, um, with a focus on archival studies. And so, yes, um, both my one of my pre professional lives, um, my prior professional lives, was as a practicing librarian and archivist, and. Um, it was really toward the end of that journey, toward the end of my master's in library and information studies, that this that this project really started. I really started thinking about this this project. Um, it was at the it was around the time that Hurricane Katrina hit um, in New Orleans, and so that that happened to coincide with me finishing my 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 LIS degree and um, and really kicking off my my archival career as an yeah yeah so that is the that is the background there um, yeah so I would just say in terms of of how that plays into the book itself um there is I really consider the records the analog records that predate so I'm looking sort of along a timeline I consider the analog records that predate these digital instances that we're seeing and I'm trying to draw some connections between these these historical analogs and and our, our current moment and you know looking toward the future so um I'm you know the records are really a, a huge part of that and that's everything from the records that we hold in our national archives in the Library of Congress to um, data as as uh, as to data archives and and those kinds of records as well. And Tamara, you are currently the director of um, the AIM Lab, the Algorithmic Impact Methods Lab um, at uh, Data and Society, um, but you were previously a professor of media studies. And so how do you, and then you also have worked, you know, for tech companies and kind of doing that. So how did that influence kind of your interest in thinking about death on the internet? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So I, you know, um, I definitely have a background in academia and also have worked in industry. And I think as I've kind of bopped around from position to position for a variety of reasons, um, I have really come to think about the, the practical steps that people can take in terms of actually designing products to be less evil <laughs> and maybe more, more ethical and more focused on care. Um, and so how do you actually change the way that production happens within a tech environment. And so, you know, AIM Lab is definitely an extension of sort of that, that desire on my part to figure out a way to really intervene in the way that tech is designed. And, um, you know, as I've kind of become more familiar with the field of user experience research, I really have come to think about my book as a way of tracing the user experience of death over time. So what are the ways that both users and platforms kind of attempted to navigate uh, changing needs uh, when it came to mourning and memorialization through online channels? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. And I want to kind of tap into this a little bit more because these are both scholarly books and they're on scholarly presses and so forth. And there's always kind of these expectations for what like a scholarly book should kind of look or how it should read. But yet you both have this very rich kind of experience thinking about the kind of behind the scenes stuff in terms of the political economy of this. Um, Tanya, you know, thinking about, I've read interviews um, where you talked about some of the work of even like kind of the different discourses of data, right? Like that you have as an archivist and a librarian and thinking about all this kind of material um, differently and thinking of data differently than sometimes 
some other data scholars are thinking about, right? Um, and Tamara, I can't help but think that given your experience in all these different worlds, including industry, you also are sometimes thinking about data differently. And so how did that play out in terms of like how you tried to write kind of a scholarly book that was in this conversation of like data and society type of scholarship? We'll start with Tanya. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, so, you know, when I think about data, I'm really thinking about the ubiquity of data and I'm thinking about data in all of its forms, right? So from like data, datum, right? Like from little tiny pieces of information and um, that data might take the, it might take, and I think about data in terms of as as scholars, what we collect in terms of of our information gathering and our our scholarship, right? So um, there are all of these different resonances and affordances um, when it comes to to data, and I think about it on all of these again, all of these different registers. So um, you know, I think that it's easy to put data into a category and be like, oh, you know, when we're talking about data, this is this is what data is, right? But I think if we actually break it down to its most simplest form, we think about it in its most basic, in its most basic presentation, um, there are so many more, there are just so many more things that we can consider, so many different approaches that we can take than if we we have sort of a singular notion of, of what data is and how it functions in society. And so part of what I'm doing with this book too is, is really delving into what are these different, what are some of these different I, like ways that we think about data, the way that data um, perseveres, the way that there is sort of a data longevity, the way it lives on past, past, uh, past us, um, the data that we create, the data that's created about us. Um, and then, you know, data collection, data use and reuse. There are just so many different, really rich ways that we can talk about data if we expand um, how, how we're thinking about it. Mm, thank you. Tamara? Yeah, I mean, I think at the heart of my project overall, and I think it comes across in the book, is kind of thinking about the relational um, elements of data production and maintenance. So, uh, and maybe this especially is a product of me kind of being in a tech environment, at least um, for a while. So thinking about the focus on solo innovation and actually in academia too, a focus on solo authorship and kind mm -hmm. of, you know, the lone genius um, as opposed to the network of editors and collaborators and people behind the scenes who enable, um, you know, so-called innovation or productivity to actually happen. And with data, I, I'm really interested in sort of a more anthropological understanding of data as this networked thing that is, um, you know, a kind of emanation of kinship ties and can be considered part of leg legacy making and inheritance. So um, <clears throat> really thinking about sort of the, the kind of intentional forms of uh, data that people produce as opposed to the ambient forms of data um, that also tend to follow them around. And so part of what I was really interested in is thinking about how all of our data that we sort of produce on an everyday basis, or what I refer to as communicative, communicative traces, which is perhaps a, an awkward term, but, um, you know, that they sort of have the capacity to become digital remains, but mm. there's this moment of sort of not knowing exactly how data will end up traveling down the road. And so, you know, what will future generations or what will say future corporations uh, decide to do with data that is produced in one context and moves into another. So um, I think um, part of what I was really interested in is exploring sort of the collectivity and also the fluidity of data in that way. Thank you. And I want to kind of explore this idea of like, what do you both and how do your books address like, what do you think remains are? Right. If the whole idea is like digital remains, what is a remain in this sense? And like, how do you think about it? But how do you think the public thinks about remains or digital remains? We're going to just go back and forth. So I'm going to just talk. Okay. 
That is like, I'm always going to be first then whatever to answer the questions. I might switch it up. I have to warn y'all. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, when I think about digital remains, like remains, and I, I think this is, uh, this is true for tomorrow too. Um, and I don't want to speak for you, but I, I think that we are both thinking about remains, the, the word, the terminology of remains much in the same way like in a digital environment, much in the same way that we talk about human remains, mm -hmm. right? And so it's the it's the it's the digital traces that are left behind after you die. It's your email, it's your text messages, it's your social media, it's your blogs, it's your, you know, it's all of the all of the digital detritus that remains, right? That that sort of endures even after we are no longer here walking on the planet. And again, that includes um, the, the 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 stuff that we are creating, like I'm saying, the email, the 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 texts, um, the social media posts. But then it also includes the 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 stuff that is being collected about us, right? This, so there's all kinds of meta, every time you take a picture, there's metadata embedded in that. Every time you, um, you know, the like our our platforms are maintaining caches of, of data. There are more dead users on Facebook now than living users. So all of this, I think, plays into this notion of remains. Um, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> Tamara, did you want to add to that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and I, I think that Tanya and I definitely have um, a very similar way of framing digital remains. And I think we both are uh, showing how they are very well connected to mortuary rituals. So again, you know, my my original sort of academic background was in cultural anthropology. And so thinking about how mortuary rituals are always sort of a way of understanding power dynamics within a society and their values. Um, and so thinking about how that plays out in a digital context, in a platform context, was um, part of what I was really interested in exploring. And I think, you know, with digital remains, they do end up sort of intersecting with other kinds of physical remains. So I think in the the one chapter that I have on illness blogs and sort of the long process of moving from a terminal cancer uh, diagnosis to um you know, loved ones sort of maintaining illness blogs during a person's illness and then after they die and the way that the sort of physical caregiving um, intersects with, you know, uh, the the sort of digital up upkeep that they're also performing on behalf of loved ones. And, you know, the same way that you're kind of sorting out <laughs> you know, records and books and clothing after somebody dies and whatever constitutes a, a physical estate, you're also doing that um, in the form of, you know, people's digital possessions mm -hmm. and thinking about sort of caring for, um, you know, funeral plans and other sort of uh, things that have to be dealt with um, in the event of a death. You're also at the same time dealing with various online accounts um, and some of them on a very practical level, like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, online bank accounts and things that are absolutely um, going to be essential for the people who are uh, the survivors. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, just always thinking about the the deep levels of embodiment and materiality that exist even within digital remains. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, I wanted to explore this because there's both of you talked about with the digital remains kind of, um, you know, thinking about it in terms of like human remains and, and, and so forth. And there's obviously, you know, um, death is kind of a universal reality that we're all going to experience it. But, um, you know, Tanya, your book deals with specifically the black body and the black body not having um, a history of ownership and self-authorship in terms of structural oppression and anti-blackness. And so I was going to ask you, what does it mean to think about kind of the black body and digital remains if part of digital, the idea of remains is also sometimes connected to ideas of like property or ownership. So yeah, I mean, we have a long history in this country of treating Black bodies as property. Um, you know, this entire country is sort of founded on this notion, um, or built anyway, not founded, but built on this notion of... Uh, um, I think there might be a glitch... Black body as, as property. And... Oh, 
better? Do you want to say something again, Tanya? Sorry. Um, yeah, I was saying that uh, we have a long history in this country of treating the black body at pe black people's bodies as property. Um, in many ways, this country was was built, if not founded, on on these notions. And what we're seeing is that this is extending into the digital into digital environments where there is an ongoing lack of of bodily sovereignty, bodily um, autonomy. Um, you know, again. It is uh, when when you already exist in a space where you have not been permitted to make decisions, authoritative decisions about your own body and the trajectory of your own life, it's just that much more galling to have that then extend into your death or digital af your your after your death or afterlife experience. And by that, I mean we are seeing the ongoing commodification of black people's bodies, um, you know, reanimating black people's bodies for white audiences for commercial purposes. Um, you know, and that's not really about memorialization. That is about, that's about the almighty dollar. And so that's really a lot. And, and I mean, the, the echoes and resonances with, with Atlantic's, with the slavery era in this country are just, I mean, I could spell them out, but I feel like this is a, an intelligent audience. And that's, you know, it's the, I, I feel like those resonances in particular are, are particularly clear. Um, you know, when I think about, I have a chapter on, on, um, on the Tupac hologram from Coachella in 2012, right? And Tupac, one of the things that he said was that one of his greatest fears of death was coming back resurrected. He didn't want to be resurrected. And so what did what did we as a society and a culture do? We created a, a hologram of him to entertain white audiences. So, you know, I think that um, those are, I mean, that's just one example of many that I raise in the book of where we see these same mm -hmm. kinds of issues, like traveling with us. We're continuing to make the same kinds of decisions. We're continuing to uh, value the same um, same bodies, the same people. And, you know, I really wanted to just draw attention to that. Thank you. And I wanted to ask, you know, this, this kind of um, uh, extending that point and then uh, bringing Tamara in, one of the things that I've been kind of fascinated by is if we think about kind of the writer strike recently, right? And and you know, um, uh, congratulations to the writers for you know, and just they held the line and so forth, and it's amazing. So, um, but there is all this kind of talk about like kind of the labor politics of being replaced um, in terms of you know as writers or as kind of cultural workers and so forth. But I wanted you guys to kind of explore that, like, how do we think about kind of replaceability and the labor politics of it through kind of what's happening with death online and with some of the political economy that you're, um, both of your books are kind of thinking through, right? What is, does the language of labor politics get at kind of this dynamic that you're exploring in your books? I mean, I definitely, oh, sorry, go ahead, Tanya. Because I definitely think that that's part of it. Um, and I think that the the other piece of it is that com the commercial, you become commercial property and you become commercial property in perpetuity. So, you know, like it's again about that kind of bodily autonomy and, you know, as you say, self-authorship. Mm -hmm. Tamara, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, and I think, you know, um, I mean, surprise, my book is about death, but it's actually about labor, right? And so, um, you know, I think the fantasy in a way of being able to sort of maintain workers even after they die and have them kind of replace living workers potentially. So moving aside from like the celebrity issue, but thinking about it within the context of, you know, writers um, or say professors. So, you know, it, um, uh, Way back during uh, the height of the pandemic, I wrote something for Slate about a professor at Concordia who was continuing to teach as the instructor of record because the videos that he had recorded 
um, mm -hmm. previously were used after he died and his students and actually even his TAs who were doing the grading for the course were not aware of the fact that he was dead. And mm -hmm. this was also done without the knowledge and consent mm -hmm. of his family. Mm -hmm. So the fact that, you know, you don't actually need generative AI um, or deep fakes or any of these things to, to um, attempt to, to do this sort of thing. And I think, you know, as faculty um, shifted online and to Zoom during the pandemic, um, a lot of us, you know, our um, our lectures and all of the materials that we created, they belong to uh, the university in perpetuity. And actually, often if you appear um, on a panel uh, at a university, we'll sign something that also says basically yeah. they can do whatever they want with your um, with your likeness and data um, attached to whatever presentation you give in perpetuity. And so, um, you know, death is sort of the the thing that I think we often focus on as being sort of alarming, like the idea that we're just, you know, reviving um, people and uh, doing what we want with them. And the, the idea that employers or corporations have the capacity to do that is, I think, especially troubling. And mm -hmm. it feels quite different from, you know, family members who are grieving, sort of deciding to interact with various sort of simulacra mm -hmm. um, of dead and, and of dead individuals, which can carry, of course, its own kind of ethical um, issues and you know mm -hmm. tensions between family members and that sort of thing. But um, I think fundamentally, this idea that you will continue to be productive and useful mm -hmm. for uh, capital um, even after you die is something that is actually becoming um, maybe a very <laughs> a very common employer fantasy, mm -hmm. as we're seeing. Um, with, mm -hmm. you know, the, with the sag um, sort of uh, contracts, mm -hmm. so much of it was about sort of AI and death and um, what it actually means to try to control uh, the dissemination of your likeness um, mm -hmm. after your physiological death. Thank you. And, you know, it's interesting when you were talking, Tamara, I was thinking about it's not just businesses that are kind of wanting everything to be recorded. It's like consumers now. If you think about when somebody says, oh, I'm doing this talk and people say, will it be recorded and live streamed? And they just, and that is kind of a newer demand, right? Like a lot of times when we did events in person, it wasn't, as we weren't kind of expected to record it or someone wasn't just, we didn't have to stop somebody say, don't record it right now and Zoom it, right? And so it's interesting because there's all these routes to kind of how people are becoming like, you know, forever enshrined on the internet and so forth. And I'm thinking, T Tanya, if you could talk a little bit about, you have a chapter about the right to privacy and I or the right to be forgotten, right? And I think that's really interesting because I think there's this assumption that everybody wants to be kind of remembered or to be, but what does it mean to kind of want to be forgotten or the right to be forgotten? Yeah, so the right to be forgotten actually comes um, out of, like in a, in a legal sense, it comes out of the EU's GDPR, the um, General Data Protection Regulation. I can't remember exactly what it stands for right now. Um, but the notion, I mean, the idea behind the legal right to be forgotten is that you um, can you can you can make the request that things that would appear in a search, like on a, in a Google search or another another search engine search, you can make the request that those things be removed from the search results. And you know, as a as a basic idea, um, the the way that it, there haven't been a lot of these cases, but the way that they have tended to play out is that, you know, people make requests based on um, based on on some kind of of wrongdoing. So, you know, the information they find the information to be inaccurate or um, there might also be uh, a sense that I don't want this information about me out there in the world. And, you know, for whatever reason, why, for whatever reason that a person may find that information to be sensitive. Um, typically, again, it's that they find it, they feel, feel it's inaccurate, but also it's, it's being portrayed in a, in, in a poor light. Um, and a lot of those things, a lot of those requests actually have to do with, with criminal, mm -hmm. criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. So, um, or perceived criminal behavior. Um, so, you know, I, <clears throat> I, I think that extrapolating out from this legal 
this legal right, this this mm-hmm. way that we think about it in terms of, you know, what are your legal rights to be forgotten? We have also divine and human rights. Mm-hmm. Um, Tanya, right. okay, that, that maybe like, again, okay, there are, you know, there are cultures on, uh, there are entire cultures of people who, for whom perpetu- living in perpetuity or, or life after death is actually not even remotely of interest, right? And so this idea that um, everyone wants to be remembered forever, um, or that there are not um, specific ways that people want to be remembered and that, you know, folks shouldn't have any say in, in how they are remembered. That's sort of where this, um, this deeper engagement with the notion of a right to be forgotten comes from. And in, it really is, again, in large part because there, we, we are not being afforded that right, mm-hmm. right? Like, we, it's not even something that that we may actively be thinking about until it's no longer an option. And so just kind of raising that flag that, you know, right now we don't, in this country, we don't enjoy a right to be forgotten um, legally or otherwise. And so what does that mean? And, you know, is that something that as a, as a society we want to, to engage? Tamara, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, this is something that comes up a lot um, when thinking about sort of the the problem of scale. And as Tanya just mentioned, sort of the, the need to be culturally sensitive um, when you're trying to come up with a sort of one size fits all uh, policy for your particular company when it, one, like, you know, the law is going to be different depending on which country um, or region you're talking about. But also this uh, this matter of what is ethical, what is culturally appropriate um, is also really important. And so the idea that, you know, Facebook as a company with 2 billion users would be able to like somehow come up with a policy that would make sense for everyone um, is just basically impossible, which is also maybe like a, an argument against uh, scale in that way. Um, yeah. And I, I think it, it is interesting too, thinking about the differences with the GDPR, um, and just, you know, in general, uh, regulation in Europe, uh, privacy rights, and it's just a very different conversation (laughs) than what we usually have in the U S. Um, and it, you know, and that is also affecting, you know, discussions around things like generative AI, because, um, you know, we are just really in many ways woefully behind um, when it comes to protecting people's rights in general uh, when it comes to data. And so um, AI is just, you know, another kind of extension of, of that fundamental problem. And um, yeah. Thank you. And Tamara, I was wondering if you could talk about, you know, a lot of these um, online platforms, they have particular terms of service. And you were saying that you're thinking about with your book, kind of also kinship, relationships, community, family, you know, labor and stuff in terms of kind of caring and and kind of tending to um, digital remains. And so how does that sometimes conflict with kind of terms of service and kind of like people's access to being able to kind of use these tools to do this digital care? Yeah, so, I mean, one one issue is that you know, each each company tends to have a different kind of process. And these processes change over time. So um, most of the major platforms have updated their policies regarding inactive accounts or dead users over the years or now decades. Um, and, you know, at the same time, with, even within the United States, each state might have a different uh, law regarding uh, digital accounts. And so um, I think many family members and individuals would like to just sort of be able to get access to digital accounts easily um, and be able to, you know, remove them or modify them in, you know, whatever way they see fit. But the problem is that um, <clears throat> if you do not have the password information, 
um, you have to go through the bureaucracy of a particular company. And so something that really struck me um, during sort of the height of the pandemic in 2020 is when Facebook had a disclaimer on their um you know, main memorialization page saying that memorialization times would be slower than usual because um, of the scale of death and also because of, you know, labor issues, because there's just like this little peek into, yes, like the content moderators and the people who are actually doing the the bureaucratic labor behind the scenes of memorialization and carrying out the policy. Um, but just thinking about how, you know, that um, that is a very different sort of situation for especially bereaved people to be dealing with um, than talking to their own like family lawyer and dealing with the estate in like, which can also be harrowing, of course, you know, um, it's never um, pleasant to be, it's very upsetting in many ways to be dealing with um, the sort of physical estate, but um, just the fact that you're kind of having to navigate each company's inner bureaucracy um, and relying on them to meet your needs is uh, is something that is definitely, um, you know, sort of a unique problem. I wanted to, we're going to take this question from a righty in a moment, but I wanted to ask, um, so, you know, uh, Tanya, you wrote a book that addresses a topic that is you know a very kind of public conversation as as especially you talk about kind of um that you wrote about you were thinking about the connections of what you saw um with post hurricane katrina and also then the murder of michael brown and the protest and and as many of us know you know there's a ongoing kind of conversation about um circulating images of black death and of black people being killed in particular by the police. And there's a lot of critiques around that where you'll see people say, please don't circulate these videos and so forth. Right. And there's a long history, um, as you know, of, uh, people like Ida B. Wells and W.E.B. Du Bois using photography. And I know you had, you did a whole archival project on Du Bois or whatever, um, and, and, and so forth. But, um, and so there's this long history of, you know, of Black political agitators and organizers using imagery, um, both negative imagery like lynchings, but also positive imagery of Black people to negotiate this public conversation. And so I was going to ask you, when you were writing your book, what do you think that you help us understand about this kind of public conversation uh, and these critiques about circulating images of Black death. What, what do you help us kind of think through with that, with your book? Yeah, um, I think one of the most important things that um, that resurrecting the Black body helps us think through that I'm that I'm that I'm trying to think through as I'm writing um, is that <laughs> no community is a monolith, right? And while there have been instances where images have been mobilized in this way, and I'm I'm not I'm not negating that or saying that uh, there isn't value in those practices, um, clearly, uh, especially the the lynching photos, right? That that Du Bois and and Ida B. Wells, as you as you say, um, circulated like in the crisis and so forth. Um, but, you know, the intent behind that, those kinds of, of circulating those images and, uh, putting an image like that on a picture, on a postcard to be sent through the mail, um, to a family member far off, like, look at what I did on Sunday after church, um, you know, the, the, there are, there are different ways that these images have been mobilized. Um, more often the way that they are mobilized is nefarious than, uh, than it is productive. Um, and I would say that there are people who have very specifically made their wishes and intentions clear or their positions and or positionality clear. Um, you know, Frederick Douglass is one of those people. He had very strong feelings about how images of uh, Black people in positions that um, were, uh, 
in, you know, in, in, in pain, in, you know, in, in any kind of sort of derogatory kind of position, um, he did like Frederick Douglass did not believe that those, that images should be used to, so there was sort of a, a, a disagreement between what Du Bois was doing and how Frederick Douglass felt. I mean, there's also a major time gap there, right? But how Frederick Douglass felt images like that should be used. So again, like no community is a monolith. The black community is not a monolith. There are there are differences of opinion and different approaches. Um, I think, we're but I think what what is at Frederick Douglass knowing that Frederick Douglass, you know, makes this statement and then we see him reanimated through um, deep nostalgia, right? Through through tech. And that's not, that's, that's specifically sort of the antithesis of of what his his stated wishes were. So thank you. I don't know if I really answered your question. Yeah, thank you. And I want to ask both of you, you know, um, given what is happening, to Palestinians in Gaza, we're seeing a lot of death on the internet. And we're also seeing a lot of people um, uh, also wanting to be remembered. And we're seeing also kind of political mobilization um, around um, trying to challenge um, the occupation and calling for a ceasefire um, in terms of what is happening to Palestinians in Gaza. And I was wondering, you know, and so the timing of your books um, are coming out and they're being circulated at an interesting moment. And I was going to ask you, what do you think your books help us understand about this current moment and about what we're seeing in terms of the violence and the horrific treatment of Palestinians in Gaza? Tamara, did you want to go first, please? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, sorry, there's a beeping on my laptop. Um, there are um, a lot of issues around sort of who actually is being publicly grieved, right? And um, who has a sort of name and personality and story attached to their to their deaths and who does not. And so, you know, what I think, what I do see is a, a really strong um, activist intervention and, you know, humanitarian intervention on uh, Twitter, which, I mean, many of us have kind of moved away from Twitter, especially as Elon Musk took over and it became unusable and terrible as X, but um, in this moment, it's become extremely important. It has also become a space for people to um, write, you know, memorials for themselves, knowing that death might be impending. Um, it has become a way to document people's humanity, their stories and their deaths and make them visible. Um, and it's also become a way to document war crimes. And so um, thinking about how Elon Musk actually uh, recently shifted access policy and began to delete inactive accounts, um, and many users were really upset because they had really thought of the, you know, um, Twitter timelines of loved ones as being part of their um, sort of digital remains, and they were memorials to the dead. So um, in this moment, it feels especially important to be able to capture um, these people's lives and their stories, and also to acknowledge their deaths in a, in a very visible and meaningful way. Um, and I, I, I think that, you know, mourning has really been central to, to a lot of the activism right now. So really acknowledging grief um, mm -hmm. and the, the humanity of the people who are being murdered in, in Palestine. Anya? Thank you, Tamar. Yeah, you know, I think for me, I would just, um, I would, I would caution care, um, because there is a certain amount of misinformation, disinformation, right? We know that, um, we know that images can be faked. Um, I'm not saying that, that, that is the, um, that that's the, the sort of overwhelming uh, case here. Um, I don't think that's true, but I do think that there are instances where we are, where we're some of the images that we're seeing aren't even, aren't real images. Um, 
And so I would just caution, I, I, you know, raise a, a cautionary flag there and then also caution care in terms of, um, in terms of the, the unexpected encounter, right? And this is the argument that I'm making in resurrecting the black body too, that, you know, when, as you are scrolling, um, you are not necessarily expecting to encounter a violent murder or, um, you know, a, 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 a dead body or piles of dead bodies. Um, and, you know, I think I think that there is an important, as um, as uh, as Tamara said, I think that there's a really important important memorialization um, and like um, sense of 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 documentation, um, and I think there are. I think you know on the on the flip side of that, there's also that that unexpected encounter with a traumatic image and you know war is traumatic and we are all you know on some on some level experiencing that trauma um so you know i think we i think without making it super individualistic i think that we also just have to 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 be careful with ourselves and our communities in terms of what we are encountering um, and the the effects that that has on the effects yeah that that has on us as as people you can't keep seeing death like that uh, violence like that and not have not have it impact you in some way shape or form so thank you now we're going to take this question from Areti um, so much of our lives are mediated by technology for better or for worse. How do you grapple with the temporality of our digital environments? Do you have any prized archival practices? If so, are they different from standard practices of digital hygiene? Um, so, you know, I would say that for me, particularly with the research I was doing, the screenshot became sort of the most important uh, archival mechanism uh, and practice for actually keeping some kind of record of a lot of the startups I was looking at and just the, the particular um, design and layout of a page over time. So obviously, um, even relatively robust platforms have changed so much over the years and features appear and disappear. And so just being able to keep track of mm -hmm. what the user experience has been like over time, um, what the language on a particular site has been like over time. And yes, the Internet Archive is great. Um, the Wayback Machine is great, but it cannot capture everything. Um, <clears throat> and my screenshots can't capture everything. And so, um, you know, I would say that in terms of, uh, you know, a sort of general practice, the, the screenshot has been perhaps the most useful one. Um, I also, I, so I see a comment from Matt McMahon in, um, about Twitter allowing people to permanently archive and memorialize the accounts of deceased loved ones. And I just want to say that one problem that I raise in my book is that, um, you know, memorialization policies require people to actively go ahead and do that work. Um, and that that is often not the case. And so, um, there are many cases where people have just sort of wanted to leave a profile as it is, or they may not have direct control over it. So, um, you know, the family member might be able to, you know, do something like memorialize a, a Twitter account, but a network of close friends and internet friends and readers and other people who are attached to the, the particular archive might not actually have any control over mm -hmm. it. So just flagging that. And I just want to also say, Tamara, you know, I think you also push us to think about the environmental impacts of kind of memorializing digital remains, um, you know, and could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and that that's something, um, especially because I was thinking so much about sort of sustainability within the context of things like data centers and software and what are the carbon emissions attached to all of the data that we're producing and trying to maintain um, and this problem of, you know, uh, preserving data in perpetuity and the idea that 
um, even if the, you know, the transhumanists are right and we're all going to uh, upload ourselves into the cloud and live on as happy, uh, disembodied, you know, perfect beings and have AI take the wheel, um, you know, all of that depends on very massive, you know, massive data centers, physical infrastructures, energy, water, other resources, in addition to, you know, the humans who actually like maintain, <laughs> maintain these infrastructures and systems. Um, and so, um, you know, that that's definitely been um, sort of top of mind for me recently, especially when we're thinking about the incredible environmental impacts of generative AI, especially. Um, and so thinking about like high energy workloads um, in this notion of sort of just maintaining the cloud indefinitely is something um, that seems especially problematic. And so finding ways to care for the digital dead without relying on these systems, um, you know, how do we how do we change that? Um, and that, yeah, that's definitely something I've been thinking about. Thank you. So we're going to take, I think we have time for these last two questions here. So one is um, uh, from an audience member. Thank you. Um, how do you think that, especially with reanimated historical figures, how uh, the resurrection of people as a result of this demand, that especially people of color in the United States always have to prove or perform being, quote, human? Um, so that, um, would anyone like to take that question? Either one of you? Sure, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to say with regard to the, the previous question, um, you know, archivists, we aren't trying to keep everything, right? Like that's not actually the job. Um, it's not possible. And so what we keep instead is a representative sample. And so I would just encourage folks to think about representative samples rather than, you know, full capture. Um, you know, if, if, if we can get a representative sample of that is 10% of everything that's out there, that's really impressive. And so we're not even, we're as, you know, as, as archival professionals, we're not really aiming to, to keep it all. That's not a thing. Remember when we were, when the Library of Congress was like, we're going to archive all the tweets. Yeah, that's not sustainable for all of the reasons that Tamara has said and, and, you know, and, and some other things. Um, <clears throat> in terms of raising the dead uh and you know things like holograms and holographs and um you know other digital instances uh, digital instances of digital resurrection um i think that there be i mean yes there is this sense that people of color black people um need to continue to prove their humanity um, the thing that really struck me with the Tupac hologram in particular was that, and you know, this is also true of the Michael Jackson hologram, the Whitney Houston hologram. It isn't, it's not just that we have to continue to prove our humanity, but that we can that that there is a, an even after death demand that we continue to perform for white audiences, perform for and please white audiences. Um, it's a it's a it's a step and fetch it it's a you know what i mean it's it is keep dancing we want to we want to we want to see those those great moves even after you're dead so can you please continue continue to feed um to culturally nourish nourish the country while even after you are dead so mm -hmm. I think that, you know, just as much as there is this ongoing, like, I still have to prove that I'm human, it's also in, I'm I'm here for entertainment, whether I'm alive or dead. Yeah, uh, Tanya, when you were talking, I was thinking about, like, uh, the philosopher Lewis Gordon says, like, the modern world hates to see Black people resting. And so it's also just this question about, like, do people, when they die, including very prematurely, like, Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston, Tupac Shakur, do they get to ever rest? You know what I mean? um, so we have a question, thank you. We have a question and we'll let this be uh, the last one. Um, and so I'm curious about the degree to which those who inherit a loved one's social media accounts might be inclined to take a curatorial or editorial role with it. Like, do we see instances of people deleting their loved one's controversial post or unflattering pictures? Are there any structures in place to prevent this? I see this being particularly applicable to the relatives of celebrities or other high profile individuals 
we might want the deceased to be remembered a certain way or for certain things. So, you know, I think both of you have been, um, and this is something that you talk about in your books about, this is very relational in terms of like, how do people remember somebody, but also want somebody to be remembered and what role do they play in how then they care for the digital remains. And so um, this will be our last question for both of you. Tamara, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, that's a great question, Harry. And, you know, generally speaking, yes. I mean, I think if, you know, loved ones and family members can go in and slightly edit um, people's profiles, they will do that. And even with, um, so with the illness blogs chapter, again, part of the kind of care work that people were providing was editing people's words um, and posting on their behalf and doing things to kind of help curate um, the the kind of digital legacy that they were leaving behind to make sure that it sort of maintained the person's voice um, that, you know, in a way that they would have wanted. And so that that's a perform that's a kind of care work that um, can, you know, entail not just sort of like scrubbing images um, or deleting kind of like uh, questionable posts or something, but also um, just the process of kind of making sure that the person is represented in a way that they they would have chosen. Um, and I'll say, you know, it is interesting, too, because um, thinking about sort of newer uh, platforms that don't necessarily have a memorialization policy in place yet. So like TikTok um, is one example, and I know that they are working on it, but um, it's the kind of situation where um, it is actually quite difficult um, in cases like that for people to actively sort of go go in there and curate. Um, and uh, so that that's something that I think will be of particular importance going forward. And from talking to a lot of sort of um, people in the field of digital estate planning, something that they've been paying particular attention to um, is the sort of influencer or sort of, um, yeah, the platform celebrity and um, what it, you know, what it would mean to try to like scrub their image after the fact, particularly if there is some sort of like monetization involved. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, that's like another, another side of it that, uh, I think might be increasingly, um, relevant. Thank you. Tanya? Yeah, I mean, I think once again, we can see the analog roots of this, right? Like people have long been, um, reframing loved ones, deceased loved ones' um, memories for public presentation. And I think that we're seeing that in, in the digital environment as well. Um, I think, you know, one thing that sort of heightens it in, in digital environments or in the digital sphere is that we are so prolific, right? Generally speaking, we're so prolific in 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 online. And so there's a lot of content there and, you know, a, a loved one almost has to act themselves as a content moderator. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one quick, quick example, um, I had a cousin who passed away suddenly, unexpectedly. Um, her parents did not know that she had a Facebook page. This was you know, almost a decade ago now. Her parents didn't know she had a Facebook page. She had been off at college for her first year and, you know, off at college doing the things that first year college students do. You know, there are pictures of her drinking and partying and hanging out with her friends. And um, when she passed away, my cousin, it, the, the page became a memorial page and her brother went in and scrubbed all of that stuff so that their parents wouldn't see it. So, you know, I think, I think people have all kinds of reasons for doing that as they have since, you know, the, the beginning of time, right? Like we, I think we are, we're, what we're looking at here are the affordances of the digital and um, how things sort of shift and change in digital environments. Thank you. So I just want to, um, we're going to, Areti is going to close out the event with some very brief remarks, but I just want to thank again, uh, Dr. Tamara Nies and Dr. Tanya Sutherland. Um, Dr. Nice's book is Death Glitch, How Techno Solutionism Fails Us in This Life and Beyond. <clears throat> and Dr. Sutherland's book is Resurrecting the Black Body, Race and the Digital Afterlife. And I wanna thank everybody here for attending and for the wonderful questions. And Areti, Areti. 
Yes, thank you all so, so much, Tanya, Tamara, Tamara, and everyone who supported this event behind the scenes, especially Tunika Onekikami, producer of this event. Um, and best of luck to those of you who entered the book giveaway. We'll be contacting the winner soon to request your mailing address. And finally, thank you to every single person that joined us today or will be watching recording online. So take care, everyone. Bye.